I go. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to Miss Both. Thanks for coming. So, I will give a few presentation of what happens recently in the MIPS uh, world, and especially in Debian. Uh, we all have seen MIPS in the last year, like uh, slow architectures with uh, plenty of things not working, people not really caring about it, but things are changing. <laughs> so in the last year, uh, I, uh, in 2012, Imagination Technology has bought MIPS, and uh, first, Everybody has said, okay, it's the end of MIPS. Uh, they have just bought the company to get all the patents, and they are going to stop the CPU. And that was wrong in practice. We have seen plenty of people on the mailing list, on free software mailing list, on the kernel, in the tool chain, QMU, and plenty of other software, starting to send patches with the email address of emgtech.com. So they really contributed a lot of patches. Things are changing. And there is a small uh, plot about the upstream uh, Linux kernel patches that have been um, that I went to the main line, and you can really see the difference between the time before Imagination Technology bought this and after, and especially in the 315 kernel, there have been a lot of patches, uh, as f uh, f including virtualization uh, for for MIPS. So things are really changing. And we'll see on the hardware, it also, it also changed a lot right now. If we look back in Debian, what we have in Debian for the MIPS ports, we have two ports, a big Indian and a little Indian ports. They are both 32-bit ports. So for people who know about that, it's the O32 ABI. It's a really old ABI so far. And in Debian, we have kernel uh, targeting various machines. Uh, most of them are 64-bit machines, uh, except for the Malta development board, we also provide a 32-bit kernel. Uh, so the Lonson 3A and 3B machines are res relatively recent. Malta development board are also uh, still developed and very recent, but the other starts to be a bit old. Uh, and if you have package in the archive, you may uh, all and know that the MIPS build daemon are slow, they don't have a lot of memory, so your package often fail to build there. But we are working on that, so for MIPS CL, we already have some uh, replacement hardware received from Imagination Technology, so we have three new Longson 3A boards, so they are called Eberlin, MIPS Elmanda 1, MIPS Elmanda 2. Uh, they, are, uh, they have 4 to 8 gigabytes of RAM, so we can build any TMPFS. Uh, using a lot of swap, but for most packages it got a lot faster. They have four cores, mm. so we we can build packages in a decent uh, amount of time now compared to the previous machine. We will get soon also along some 3B machines that we arrive in a data center that is in Leeds. So thanks to Imagination Technology, we got of contact with this uh, AQL company, and they will uh, provide for Debian a full uh, 48U uh, rack for putting a MIPS um, machine, but also other machines. And that's what you have on the photo on the bottom. There are the three uh, Octeon 2 machines that are waiting for the MIPS port. So MIPS CL now is going pretty fine with regard to the build demons, but MIPS is always slow, as well, uh, at least 20, 30 packages in the queue. Uh, but we hope that to change in the next uh, weeks when the, the rack is all wired. We are waiting mostly for a switch now to, to run it. And if we look at the problem of these ports, we see that a lot of packages start to fail with the failure of virtual memory exhausted. So people often ask us, oh, can this package can be retried on a build daemon with more memory? The problem there is not the memory of the machine, it's just you have a, in a 32-bit world, you are limited to, depending on the architecture, to two, three, or four gigabytes of memory per process. In the MIPS world, the way the address space is, is done, uh, you are limited to 2 gigabytes, except for recent version of MIPS with the EVA extension that are limited to 3 gigabytes of RAM per process. So we are seeing that to happen more and more often, and there are even i386 packages that fail to build on i386 due to that. So clearly, in the long term, uh, all Debian ports are going to switch to 64 bits. 
And also, it's worth to be noted that the MIPS and MIPSCL ports target a very old ABI, which is a MIPS2 ABI from the R4K uh, era, so for the old SGI machines. Uh, that's why we are looking for getting new ports uh, that are faster and re reusing better the, the hardware. So, first there was the MIPS N32 ports, so the, both in little and big and version. That has been the subject of various uh, Google Summer of Code. And the idea of this ABI is to use the 64 bit registers because most of the CPU on the MIPS world have a 64 bit registers. And but keep 32 bit uh, pointers. It's like the x32 ABI uh, on the i386 world. The main issue, it was probably a good idea five years ago, but uh, now we are at we are this. Uh, architecture is still limited to, to two or three gigabytes of memory per process. So it might still work for now, but in a few years it will be a problem in Debian. <coughs> Mostly it happens when with GCC or uh, binutils when you try to build a big C++ code and try to link it, you need a lot of memory. <laughs> so the other problem is the fact that you have 32-bit pointers and 64-bit registers. Uh, there are plenty of code mixing uh, pointers with uh, long and integral values, and so there is a lot of code to parse. Of course, the, the code is, is broken that way, but it exists, it's like that, and we probably don't want to spend too much time on fixing this, especially that people continue to write such code, so it's a continuous process to fix it. So we are not really interested by having such a port in, in Debian anymore. What we are interested to have is a mid port targeting the N64 ABI, so it's a 64 bit ABI. Well, we have, I've told us most TPU are 64 bits already, so it's not a problem. And at the same time, we want to uh, increase the, the minimum instruction set that is necessary to run these ports. We want to target the mid 64 ABI, so you get more instructions, and probably even the mid 64 R2 ABI, which is not fully decided yet. So you can have more uh, instructions and really better use the, the hardware. And now if we look also what happens is that most uh, hardware that is um, most hardware that is being sold today are either little Indian or B Indian. So for now we only think about doing a 64 bit little Indian port. And the experience has shown also that supporting a 64-bit big Indian port like the S390 export or even Spark 64 is difficult. There are plenty of ugly casts between pointers uh, for long and two int values uh, in the code, and so it has to be fixed. But with MIPS and it's like in, uh, with Spark, you also need to enforce the strong alignment, otherwise you get sick bus, and that means ever less code is going to, to run. That's why so far we are only interested to have a, a 64 bit little Indian port. And so there is already an unofficial MIPS 60 RL port. port. Uh, it's currently hosted at this URL. Uh, and right now it has a 909,000 package built of 10,900, so almost everything is built. Uh, the ones that are not built are just most of them out of date because the build demand were only too much and they are not fast enough. Uh, they are only too long some three based build demands. And for the other packages that fail to build, most of them have the patch in the BTS. So it's just a matter of getting them merged. Uh, and then the, we can get the NIF60 or 4 year port. And we expect to be able to enter to put this port in the an official port in the IBM archive soon. We are mostly waiting for additional build demands to the MIPC, MIPC L1 to be able to, to build the packages uh, fast enough. I want to talk also about what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Imagination Technology is uh, currently developing a MIPS L6 ESA. So it will bring plenty of things because even the MIPS 64 ESA is based on very old 
ESA from the Air 4K era. I mean, there are new instructions, but you cannot get rid of uh, existing uh, instructions, otherwise you break the compatibility. And actually, that's what is going to be done with the L6 ESA. So the idea is to support uh, analyzing access, to get rid of these delay slots that people probably know uh, about that. That's after a jump instruction. The next instruction, next instruction after it is also executed always. So that was done at the time when the instruction execution was fully sequential. <coughs> now most of CPU are using out of order execution. So it doesn't really make sense to, to keep that in, in, in the CPU. And it's actually the same for the multiplication and division instructions. There are two registers, high and low register, that store the results of this uh, instruction. The idea was that given they take a lot of time to execute, you start your multiplication, your division, uh, there is a separate unit in the CPU doing the, uh, the computations and providing this in separate registers. That means the other instruction can execute in, this, in the meantime. That was already a kind of out of order execution, uh, but now that the, the whole CPU is out of order, it doesn't make sense to keep that. So mm, these instructions are going to be removed and new instruction is provided to do that directly in the normal registers. You, this ISA also adds some um, program counter relative load store instruction, which is uh, very important for uh, position independent code, which is something that uh, is more and more important, especially with regard to security and with libraries. Uh, it adds the select instruction, so it's the instruction when you Depending on the condition, you load one register or the other one. And it provides also uh, FPU compatible with the I3754-2008 revision, which uh, provides plenty of additional instruction, like the minimum and the maximum of values. So this, this is included in this ISA. So it's something still in development. We expect uh, that to arrive, uh, the hardware to arrive in about six years. But uh, Imagination Technologies already provided patches to add the support to QMU. And I told that the, um, the idea will break, the, 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 the new ISA will break the current uh, ABI, but uh, there, are, there is possibility to build uh, binaries using the common instruction set between the previous MIPS CPU and the new ones. Uh, so at some point we might want in Debian to rebuild our binaries to support both and do kind of a transition. Alternatively, we might want to do new ports depending on how the hardware is going. A bit like it has been done on the ARM world between ARM EL and ARM HF when ARM HF targets a more recent CPU than ARM EL. Then I'm going to talk you a bit about uh, a board uh, that can be used uh, for development. It's a board like uh, a bit like the Raspberry Pi uh, that Imagination Technology has developed. It's a board that is uh, available there. You can see it after the talk. Uh, it has a dual core 1.2 GHz CPU, so unfortunately it's only MIPS32, but for running uh, the MIPS CL port is not a problem. It's little and yet only. And uh, it uh, has an HDMI output, so you can use it uh, on a full HD screen. Unfortunately, it's not compliant with the setup of the video team there, so we won't be able to show you the, the output of uh, this board. It has one gigabyte of RAM, uh, eight gigabyte of flash. You have an internet connection. There is even wireless and Bluetooth, so you can work, for example, in the Lab on it uh, without uh, needing an internet connection. You have the, the Wi-Fi for that. And it has USB port. And more importantly, it runs uh, by default. It's uh, shipped on the flash with Debian Wheezy. So there are very little changes, mostly the kernel and a few firmware. and um, by default, it's changed to run XFC, but very few modifications. So that's something great, and we will probably s it will be probably possible to get also Debian uh, Jesse running on it, um, probably with just the kernel because the patches for the kernel are being sent right now, and it's probably going to be too late to be included in the Debian kernel. 
and it's there. So if you, oops, if you are a bit too too far, uh, there are some photos of the board. It's how it's arrived and the two sides. Uh, so the first batch of board is only for developers. So I got this board from Image Intelligent Technologies. I have to say I received it just before DevCon, so I don't <laughs> haven't I haven't fully played with it yet, but it looks quite uh, interesting. And you can follow the link there. And Imagination Technology uh, offers um, boards for developers who have a project describing how to use that. It will be later available on the market, but right now it's not the date is not yet known. And if you want to see it running the Yanwizi, let's. Uh, that's when it, how it runs. So it's a very small board compared to the screen and, and the keyboard. And if you want to, I don't know if it's fully readable, but a comparison between the the CI20 board, the MIPS board, and other uh, ARM-based boards, so the Raspberry Pi uh, B+, plus or the BeagleBone Black. Uh, um, basically, the CPU is uh, faster, especially that it has dual-core CPU. You also have uh, a faster uh, um, GPU on it that's supposed to uh, decode or encode uh, H.264 uh, videos. I haven't tried. I don't know what is the status yet with regard to uh, firmware, if it is free or non-free. I think it's, it seems at least in Debian what is installed to work uh, without any firmware and without any binary uh, driver. I have to look more at it. Uh, so it has more memory also and what you, you have also is the wireless, which is an addition to Raspberry Pi. You don't have to plug an, an external uh, Wi-Fi dongle on it. And you can plug a camera on it. Also, there is an interface for camera. There is plenty of I.O. if you want to interface to the outside world. And there is even an infrared receiver if in case you want to use a remote control. I haven't fully played with it. So we. I can sh boot the board maybe if you want to to see there is not it's not a lot because we don't have the screen so it will be only through the CIR port and otherwise uh, if you are open to question we are open to question discussion so don't hesitate to ask things there in the meantime I will uh, boot the board I have a serial cable so if you switch to ISR6 then is the idea to allow backwards compatibility by having process running R5 instructions on the same kernel by possibly trapping the uh, defined instructions and emulating them in software? So, because on ARMHF you can still, even on an ARMHF capable kernel, you can still run ARMEL binaries. So, I think if we switch to an R6 port, then we should at least make sure that you can still. Uh, the old binaries for a while. So far, I don't know if anything is planned. It's really the beginning of the R6 ABI. I mean, it's public so far. Uh, the instruction set is public. You have it on the MIPS uh, Imagination Technology website. The problem here yeah, is that they have removed instruction, but they reuse the, uh, the encoding space for new instructions. So I don't know if it will be possible to trap. Uh, or not the instruction. It depends, I guess, on the implementation. They could just have a bit where you say if you switch, where if you enable that bit, and the, inst the new instructions will not actually, will actually cause a fault instead of. Maybe that's something possible. I think it's too early to, to know about that. Uh, imagination Technologies is working on keep that compatibility and, and, and that will be some feature that will be transparent to users. Any more questions? I think I will just unplug it and plug it again. So you talked a bit about... So it. yeah, it's... Oh, sorry. I was saying the, the, the board is booting right now. It's using U-Boot, so the sources of U-Boot are available. And the sources of the kernel are also available. Uh, it runs an UBFS file system, something new to me, but so right now it's loading. 
Now we can see it's uh, loading the. Can maybe increase the size of the font, so loading the all the device, and it takes a lot of time to recover the UBFS file system because I just unplug the the board and plug it again to reboot it. So maybe can you ask your qu question? So um, that looks promising the new ports, uh, but you didn't talk anything about the old ports. So. Um, about the old ports, yes, MIPS and MIPS here. And yeah. And uh, so during the last two years, there were a lot of promises to work on these. Uh, there were a lot of promises to, to get hardware for these ports. We have got hardware yeah. for it, yeah. Well, currently, uh, the MIPS uh, porter machine doesn't exist. The MIPS cell machine is unstable. The build keys are slow. No, the, um, MIPS, the, MIPS, the buildings on MIPS have been replaced, so we have long since three emissions. So they are not. The, the portal so box. So the now portal it box. Oh, it's me doing that. The portal box uh, is, um, is still the slow one, yes, but we are, we are waiting for the new machine to switch the portal box from, uh, to right, the new machine. But that, that, that was promised two years ago. So will this happen, or I just fear that. Uh, we add two new architectures and don't get rid of the old architectures, and I can't see that that anybody is working on these. Well, the hardware is already there. It's just, uh, for example, in AQL, the hardware is there. We are waiting for the rack to be set up. It's not so easy uh, as expecting to get everything working. We, we received the hardware already six months ago, so it just take time. I think in the next weeks, really, it will be wired. Uh, so, so I'm really asking, is, is it possible or is Debian uh, able to support four MIPS architectures? No, the idea is not to go to four MIPS architecture, the idea is to go to three right now. We don't want a 64-bit big Indian port, we only want a little, little okay. Indian. And yes, the idea in the long term is to drop uh, MIPS and MIPS here. Maybe we, for JC we want to keep them. For JC plus one, maybe we will have Why? to drop them. Why keep them? Because they are, otherwise we don't provide any port with JC. And they are still working fine. Look, there is a Jesse that well, can work on this board. Well, is something which isn't that uh, true. So debugging currently on the machines uh, is, well, uh, set up a CH root, uh, try something, uh, find, uh, well, the machine is rebooted for several reasons. Uh, so That's, yeah, that, I agree there is a problem on this so board, yeah. But so the new boards are there. I, sh but yeah, I have a photo of them even. <laughs> well, I, I don't care about the photos. You showed me the photos two years ago. No, no, these photos are new. <laughs> it's not from two years ago. So is, he, is there anybody in the room uh, supporting MIPS as a porter in, in Debian? Uh, we have the machines ready to be installed. We have a we have a problem in Debian. Debian is moving very slowly. We are trying to get more machines working, and DSA needs more people to to help with this problem. So, this basically it w we we got the machines ready to install maybe two months ago, but DSA is moving very slowly because they don't have the manpower. And also, I mean, we are going to install this machine in a new data center. It's a new location from the SA, and it takes time to, to arrange all the details. And the new data center in Leeds that we have is because the data centers that were in Germany in, or in other places, um, they didn't move quick enough to get these machines up and running. For the long sound 3A, we wait three months, the machine were shipped, they arrive, and we wait three months before they've been racked, so. More questions? Um, so, what, how flexible are the existing MIPS kernels at the moment? I mean, um, is it feasible to have a single Z image that will support lots of devices, or do we need to uh, pick specific board support? No, that's currently an issue, and we need to have a kernel support. So the the new kernels are supporting 
more and more boards. Before it was one kernel per board, now it's more like one kernel per uh, type of CPU. But it's, we will have to get through the through a common kernel at some point, like has been done on ARM, but so far it's not yet ready. Uh, there is already device three support in MIPS that, that works, but device three is not enough to get it working. You also have to get all the devices converted to device three and get a, a single kernel after. And on MIPS you have all these soft DLB lockups and every CPU does it differently, so that's not so easy either, I guess. Yeah, it's our, easy. Our architecture is, even the ARM architecture is more standardized because every, like on MIPS you have soft DLB lookups and you have to really synthesize your soft DLB lookup code per processor, which is, I think, makes it more complicated to make a single kernel for. Yeah, I, I think right now MIPS is in the same state than the, from the kernel point of view than the pre V7 ARM, yeah. where nothing was standardized and uh, you had, we had to get plenty of flavor. Since ARM V7 standardized a bit the things, yes. Sir. A uh, single kernel was possible, and maybe the new ABI will also specify more the details about how booting a CPU, and uh, and maybe we can expect to have a single kernel. Right now, it's really a problem also that when we get new machines, we need to have support in stable for this kernel or in backports, but it takes time, and often we we are waiting for having the kernel before being able to use the machine. So. I remember that I was at some point yet another. I, so there are many MIPS ABIs, but there is N64 and N64. O64 and also. there is, and there was there was some proposal by MIPS Technologies was not yet part of imagination to have yet another new ABI which would be exist in both 32 and 64 with flavors and would be somewhat similar to N32 and 64 but yet different. I don't exactly know why it was different, but the web pages are still existing. So has anyone considered reviving that proposal, or has anyone investigated why that proposal was made and was supposed to be better than N64? Because now, if you decide to now switch to a new ABI, maybe it's worthwhile and we don't have any legacy backward compatibility on N64 anyway, it might be worthwhile looking into if that proposal makes sense or not. I guess the only reason you would not want to do that is if you want to have compatibility with IRIX N64 binaries, which probably no one in the world cares about anymore. Yeah, but in the MIPS world, N64 is quite uh, standard for 64 bits. I know that uh, there was a distribution using this uh, ABI and I know that Gavium has an internal uh, distribution using N64 source, and it also means that all the software that have assembly code is uh, using this ABI. So probably we don't really want to, to switch to an ABI that is not fully supported in the, in the world, so yeah, it means plenty of porting to do. Uh, but yeah, at some point we might investigate also before doing that. Uh, if this new ABI is more promising or not, but it looks like that, I have to say. Yeah, I don't I'm not sure how far they ever got to it with that idea. I remember at some point that it was sort of like set in stone that they would move to it, but then it all disappeared again. And I've I'm not sure if that is actually has been there have been patches for tools to tool chain to make I don't think so. Or oh, this is only the wiki pages. <laughs> I think the, the ABI that you were mentioning is um, N32 big. Um, the, the reason that N32 only has two gigs of virtual address space is because the pointer yeah. winds up being sign yeah. extended. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and you lose the high bit. Um, the N32 big ABI was going to just change what happened to that bit. So you actually get four gigs. Um, the person that was going to do that then decided it was a bad idea because I think we have enough ABIs already. Um, and if you want more than two mm -hmm. gigs, you should probably just use a 64-bit ABI because you have a 64-bit CPU already if you're running N32. Yes. So That's true. The, the, the highest bit is defining if you are in a user space or in kernel supervisor space. 
in the uh, new MIPS uh, R3 insertion set, you have uh, the EVA extended virtual address uh, mode, which allow you to use this IBID also for our user address space, but in, you need uh, for that uh, uh, hardware support, which is not all hardware yet. Um, probably it's better to switch to 64 bit directly. That's kind of funny because the A6 world is exactly doing the opposite by claiming that they they have a performance advantage by especially on smaller chips with smaller caches to have processes which you do not actually need four gigabytes of more than four gigabytes of virtual address space to keep them as 32 bit. Well, at least keep the pointers in 32 bit and use the 64 bit in which uh, which always has been the idea of N32 and N64 in general. The idea was that. You only use 64-bit where it makes sense for maybe like the C compiler or anything which requires lots of memory, but not for smaller programs. Yeah, I think that was a good idea five years ago, but now more and more uh, processes are more and more software is using the 4 gigabyte memory. And even now with uh, we have smartphones with taking cam with uh, cameras with very high number of pixels is probably silly, but the result is that you have big files to handle, big files to... Yeah, that's And in the, in the next year, we will need 4 gigabytes, uh, more than 2 gigabytes at least uh, for almost everything. That's a pity, but it's how the uh, world... Sure, you working. don't need 4 gigabytes for LS and Bash. And that's true, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you will need it for GCC, but then, okay, that's... That's fairly relevant if you're building. And the, uh, the idea there is that also the hardware is evolving, so when you target, it's like IBM64, uh, you get bigger pointers, but at the same time you get new instructions. So you, yeah, you overall it's already. still faster. I guess it depends a bit on how much cache you have, and it probably depends on the kind of application you're looking into. Mm -hmm. a question? Yeah, I mean, continuing on this, the same point, I mean, there is an ILP32 mode which people are pushing for ON64 as well. Um, again, um, it's all about your instruction cache size uh, and data cache size more than anything else. Um, X32, if it makes sense, makes much more sense on X86 because it gets you away from the utterly, absolutely terrible uh, register limitations on I386 on MIPS and ARM where, where you already have a reasonable set of registers already in 32-bit 30, in mode. Um, there isn't necessarily the same win by actually shifting over to the uh, horrible mixed or limited 64-bit version. Um, ILP32 is, you know, it, it's going to end up coming out, it's going to be used by, by some people, but as a general purpose system, it's doesn't really make much sense. Yeah, you don't need four, you know four gigs for LS. You know everybody is aware of that. But the extra complexity of having two sets of libraries on the system and whatever is, frankly, it's a mess. You know we can do it better in, in Debian with multi arch than most other people can. But still, why do you actually need all the hassle? Yeah, exactly. And for <laughs> <laughs> you have a question. Uh, <coughs> sorry, um, the point might have been made already, but uh, we have packages in the archive that need uh, more than two gigabytes of VM to link. Uh, so anything that's, and that's only going to get worse. So um, I think any new, any new 32 bit architecture is, is, is going to have problems being a complete architecture. Uh, and uh, I'm not really convinced it makes sense to add in, add, continue adding any of those two architectures as release architectures. Mm. Yeah, maybe it makes sense for the embedded world when you rebuild all your binaries before shipping your, your device, but for Debian with targeting, uh, having uh, plenty of packages, desktop packages, uh, and so on, it doesn't make sense to keep such a bit, I agree. At least in the long term, we probably want to keep the existing port for one more release, but in the long term, we have to switch to 64 bits.
Uh, hello. I, I was wondering maybe the problem with the 32 bits and 2 gigabytes of memory, could that possibly uh, have be helped with the cross-building stuff? Or Yes, you can cross-build. That's, that's the point. But probably something we don't uh, want in Debian so far. I don't know if it will change. So far, the position has always been to na build natively everything. I don't, maybe it can be changed. I think one of the ideas is that someone uh, on a machine can just fetch the sources, patch, patch the package of the they want, and rebuild it. If you start needing a cross compiling environment, then it makes the setup more complicated. Now, maybe in the long term, we want to change that. I don't know. I think you can't blindly cross compile. You always have some configuration issues which you have to, to look at package for package. and. Um, I don't see it as a default. If you know your environment, if you know your packages, you can cross compile. But uh, I don't see it as a general solution to to overcome the 32-bit limitation or 2 gig limitation. Mm. Another question. If you are interested. In this course, you could register your interest at the web page, or you could leave it with us. And we could send you a, a port in the mail. Looks like it's finished. Thanks a lot for attending.
more like the, the actual physical room. Uh, uh, so he has the, the, the drum and interface and all you need to run your own I love your presentation. Thanks. Thanks. It's only 2% income. <laughs> <laughs> so, I still have to ask you why you would use people in your own SPL. I didn't use the to use SPL. Uh, oh, uh, I use keep over because I can find the people who are using keep over. Did you have any presentations yet? Okay. That's a better. Uh, 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 uh. You can do snapshots or you can do I'm able to connect to them. Where did you download that? What? Debian. It's in Debian. This camera is in demo mode. I'm actually tempted to zoom in on people who are. Thank you. 
Okay. It's 11. News 